Andy, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, welcome to the Royal List. We're going to um, talk a little bit about your Navy career, and then we're going to talk about the transition to Civvy Street, and then I know we're going to end up talking about all the exciting projects you've got on now. So let's start with a little bit about talking about your career in the Royal Navy. Okay, no, thanks, Fiona. I really appreciate the chance to uh, come and talk to you guys. Um, well, I've got to cash in mind back a few years. I joined the Navy in 1988, which is quite a long time ago, as a junior aircraft engineering mechanic, a JM2 at 17 straight from a, a youth training scheme with the Yorkshire Electricity Board, if anybody remembers those, paid £27.50 a week, I think it was. And um, I then decided I'd join the Navy. And my dad told me at that time I was going to put all my eggs in one basket. And I had a career for life with the YEV. And I'd been accepted for an apprenticeship with them. But Subsequently, everybody on that apprenticeship was made redundant or had to transfer to another branch. So I, I did make the right decision. I went through, ended up on the Harrier circuit, um, quickly ended up going on Mex course and becoming an artificer. And then I retrained in 1995 to do non destructive testing. And uh, spent 12 years in the Navy and then took the decision to leave. So, uh, what, when, you, when, you, when you left, um, were you were you, did, did, were you sort of pushed? Did you pull? How ready do you think you were for the <laughs> Civic Street? Back in 1997, we'd set up Navy Rugby League, and that, that was the first start of the tri services. So um, that was myself and Petty Officer PT Wayne O'Kell, who became onto the, to be the fleet PTI. Um, Wayne was going to sea with, that, with who is now Admiral Parry on, I can't remember which ship, so I was being penciled in for a desk job. And I said, great, you know, all my dreams have come true. I can work full time and, and focus on my passion, which was rugby league. And then my ex-wife got pregnant and I'd committed, <laughs> I'd committed to leave, and quite rightly so, because she said, you know, you can't, her words, you can't go around gallivanting around the world playing rugby and drinking, which I thought was a really good way to go. <laughs> so I did leave um, and it, it was good advice because then I did get time to spend with my kids and watch them grow up. So that was, uh, that was the end of my naval career and it, it was um, 2000 that I left. And, uh, and what, did, what did you do about getting your first job then? fresh out of the Navy with your new proper grown-up responsibilities and outlook? I think this was, um, we were just starting to probably learn about email or use e email. So it was the, the old way of do, doing it, put a CV together and uh, post it. So I posted hundreds of CVs out there. And as an NDT technician, I was getting work, offered work offshore because we do non-destructive testing of metals on air, air frames so the the prospect of working in Aberdeen which is great when it's sunny but when it's not it's a grey drab city just wasn't alluring and then I'd also have to commute from Hull to Aberdeen when uh, at the time that wasn't very easy so I, I received a phone call one day literally a guy had asked me he said um, are you looking for a job said, yeah and said, so why don't you pop in on Friday? So I did, and that, it was a company called Deutsch. They're a German company. They do large diesel engines for ships and trucks and also power stations. So I popped along for an interview while I was on leave. And he, he as you expect, come out of the military, I was booted and suited, and he was in jeans and a polo shirt, which I found really unusual. And he said, oh, don't worry, it's Friday afternoon, we dress down. So I sat through this interview and it basically said to me, um, look, well, we're looking for a maintenance manager for a power station in Sri Lanka. First of all, I didn't know where Sri Lanka was. <laughs> Secondly, I said to him, I think you've got the wrong guy. Um, I've worked on gas turbines. These are big diesel gensets. And he said, don't worry, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. They're all the bloody same. <laughs> so, so he put me on a call with the manager who was out there. Um, we spent... 20 minutes talking about rugby and football because he was also from Hull. And the next thing he ended with, uh, you can't take this job unless you come out and see the place. 
So I went home thinking, great, you know, let's, let's see what happened. I was asked, well, what, how did it go? I said, well, I think I've been offered a job, but they want me to go out and visit the site. At that time, didn't have computers, so I looked on the old encyclopedia to find out where Sri Lanka was. <laughs> And on the Monday morning, off I flew out to Sri Lanka and spent a week there. And at worst, I thought, well, at least I get a free holiday in the sun. Yeah. And um, I think the turning point there was that I saw elephants walking down the street. And I actually thought, if I don't take this opportunity, I'll regret it. Yeah. And I've come full circle now. You know, 20 years later, I'm back in the UK, and it's been an, an interesting journey along the way. So, so you you really didn't go looking for work. It came it came looking for you. Well, I think as it stands, and this is one thing that I've noticed certainly when I went into that role as well. I, I actually employed ex-military people from Sri Lankan Air Force, Navy, and Army because of the discipline, mm -hmm. and that's what they wanted. They were looking for somebody that had that discipline, had also respect, good timekeeping, and I would say that that we are quite methodical in what we do. We also, we've got a willingness to roll our sleeves up and get the job done. And that's why they brought me in and had a great time there, I've got to admit, really enjoyed my time there, but I realized I couldn't move any further. And then other opportunities unfolded for me. So I ended up leaving and moving to Thailand. So when you see so that, that opportunity, um, you know, presented itself and you, we're in the lovely position of having to talk yourself into don't be a fool and walk away from it. When you realised it was time to move on to the next thing, a decision you hadn't done before and a move you hadn't made before, how did you how did you feel about doing that? Was that a difficult thing to do, to look at your second job and find it and negotiate and deal with the money, those sort of challenges? How, how did you cope with that? Um, I think I've got to track back. I think... It any change is difficult but for me leaving the UK going to a foreign country in a new industry in the civilian world was really daunting you know and it, it's not easy I know we're quite um, we've got quite broad shoulders we can do it but you find your feet you roll your sleeves up and you get the job done um, I got to a position in all honesty whereby it was quite easy for us once we implemented basic procedures that they they were struggling to do simple things that we take for granted so you put some structure around it and everything fell into place the, the power station started to increase production 30 percent year on year uh, they didn't have a health and safety committee so i went in and set that up they won the national safety awards within a year of doing that and i'll be honest with you eventually i got bored Mm. Um, we had a computerized maintenance system that nobody had took the time to learn. Mm. So they were working on spreadsheets to calculate hours for bearing changes and structured um, engine changes. So I took it apart piece by piece, as you would with an aircraft, mm. sign for everything, put it back together. And that's how we improved the productivity, just by being analytical on the task. Mm. And eventually, once it was all running, I, I was coming in in the morning at eight o'clock pressing the maintenance orders, giving them to the ex-chief um, stoker and saying, there you go. Mm. And uh, within 30 minutes, until we, Europe woke up, I had nothing to do other than go and check it to clean things and make sure everything was in place. So I, mm. so I actually got bored and then went on to do an MBA mm. and also set up a, a real estate company that I was running at the same time. So, uh, you know, it, it was it took me three years to get to that position. Mm. honestly but three years of hard work and and then another opportunity came along whilst I was doing my MBA um, a gentleman that owned a forestry company had followed my progress seen the National Safety Awards and at the time I was 30 I was a bit of a, a young gun uh, telling my managers that um, if the guys on the shop floor made a mistake, they had to take responsibility for it, which they didn't like. But I eventually got them round to morning meetings, structure, and um, this guy had seen what I was doing and, and asked me if I would uh, relocate. Mm. Um, and, I, and I did. I jumped ship. Um, actually, it was less money, but more responsibility. 
So I headed up a, a company that was opening offices in Dubai, Hong Kong, had a big base in Sri Lanka and an, an office in Thailand. But for me, it was a bit like going from Colombo with all of the Tamil Tigers and the civil unrest there that we went through to move into Los Angeles, a city with bright city lights that didn't sleep. So um, I think I jumped without looking in all honesty, but mm. because I got bored in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, and and do you do you think that um, yeah to what obviously that structured approach you've described came absolutely from your engineering training and the discipline in the in the navy and clearly the company that that um, employed you was looking for that um, when you when you look back now a bit further and a few other things you've done. What are the real strands that have come from your naval experience that you can track all the way through that you still rely on now? I think there's quite a few. Respect, discipline, timekeeping. <clears throat> you do have a lot more time in the forces. And you, well, when I served, you did seem to have a lot more time, especially for recreation as well. You would mm. be on a Wednesday afternoon. But you took that disciplined approach forward. And that's what is missing in City Street, in all honesty. I just see absolute mayhem. And it's a it's a relief when I find military people because they don't they don't stick to the job description. Mm. They don't say, I'm not doing that because it's not in my job description. They will roll their sleeves up. And I think that's the trait that we've all got, mm. the, the capacity to get the job done. And that's quite an endearing factor, really, that we're not clock watching, mm. thinking we've got to be out the door at five o'clock because if there's a task to be done, we finish it. Uh, and that's something that I'm, I hope that other lot, other employers look for, mm. especially employing forces, guys. It's one of the things I've observed in the last couple of years is that I agree with, with everything you've said there about those positive qualities and, you know, not walking by things and wanting to, to solve problems, being very good at change. And yet it's a bit of a contrast with a lot of people who completely fail to own their own resettlement and and their process. Um, and you've heard, you know, when Sam introduced himself that he thinks he's still in resettlement nearly two years after he, you know, what I call our day, last day of service. What, what stage do you think you were at where you stopped describing yourself as a, former Matlow and were you know, actually fully resettled? I don't think you ever do, <clears throat> in all honesty. Um, I'll caveat that by saying that I was recently with the NHS Teaching Trust and they have a veterans group and the next army doc that's in there. And the minute you walk into a room, there's 15 veterans there. It's as if you're back on board in the mess, you know, um, the camaraderie comes back and the, the little jibes between the senior service and the rest etc and then it's just an accepted and a really nice warm feeling in all honesty so i did i I'd missed that i ought to be honest i've had eight i had 18 years away from it mm. and i'd lost that and when i came back it was such a an endearing element that i realized wow i've i've, I've missed it so with that in mind i don't think I realized that I'd separated and, and you know, technically disengaged from the forces because I signed the waiver so I couldn't be a reservist. You wouldn't find me in Sri Lanka. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I didn't have that connection. I left and it was cold turkey, so mm. to speak. Um, new country, new job. Um, probably first time as a serviceman actually living with my family because we're weekenders and you know, weekend warriors and uh, leave. So that was also challenging. Um, and yeah, you, you miss it, but I don't think I ever uh, realized until I came back 18 months late, 18 years later. You know. So, so now you're, um, so now you're back and you're in Hull and you're, uh, you're sticking your fingers into uh, ever increasing numbers of pies. Um, so let's do a, a tour around them because it's, you're absolutely getting your, you are absolutely um, working with veterans as a veteran. You must be going into rooms full of military banter 
almost every day. So you've always you've re- absolutely sort of come the, the full circle after yeah. your your adventure. So so you tell us a little bit about what you're what you're up to now. Well, I think I've got to track back a little bit. Um, when when I went across to Thailand to work for a forestry company, I was challenged by the chairman of that company, and he brought me in to expand it and put some structure in place. And he said I'd never get anybody to donate money to plant trees. Um, he believed, as a forestry company, he believed in triple bottom line principles, in as much as people profit planet. But that was that was it. It was a marketing gig for him, and he thought that the commercial aspect of what he was doing was enough. And I believed you could do a lot more. Mm. And it's, it, I would say, we come full circle. I, obviously, a true believer in the environment, um, biodiversity, wildlife habitat creation, and all of the amazing factors in this CO2 sequestration. That's where I was heading and, and believed in it. And I did wear my heart on my sleeve. And I, believe that we could have done more as a company he didn't agree parted ways actually quite shortly after that and i ended up setting up a forestry company and running that for the best part of uh, 12 years in thailand before coming back to the uk and in parallel we whilst we did work commercially in forestry and we produced perfume oil and sold oil to the, the middle east and that's the caveat that the, the only englishman to sell oil back to the middle east um, I believe we could do more. And mm-hmm. so we, we set about, I took a group of people to the Burmese border to plant trees at an orphanage. And there were fruit trees and teak trees. That was to allow them to get some fruit, some food, but also some economic value because the teak trees, which will now be probably on their second thinning, they'll have made some, some good money from them. And that expanded, and, and I was told by a gentleman who came along, he said, look, with, with attraction, we'll get traction. And the next thing you know, uh, I had a phone call from somebody in Singapore, Roger Hamilton, said, what do you need? And I was a bit shocked by that. And he said, well, where do you want to go with this? Um, and this was before carbon offsetting had become a real mainstay element. So I said, well, trees remove carbon, I can see an angle here. So he said, I'll pay to set the charity up in the UK, um, pay for your website. And what, what was a little hobby with 15 people that just came out to the Burmese border then started to become a full-time job in parallel to my work. So we ended up planting 3 million trees in seven countries across yeah. Asia. And then we, part of that, we had an office in Dubai. So I was planting trees in the desert. It was actually mangroves. And then I came back to the UK. Um, I exited the business, but we'd always used the UK as a fundraising angle for gift aid, but never actually been operational here. Mm-hmm. So I was invited to sit on the Haywoods Community Forest. And that literally led to me getting involved with the Northern Forest Initiative and finding ways in which we can plant trees. And that's led to what you're seeing now, where um, yes, juggling a lot of different options, a lot of things going forward. And in all honesty, it's been that military network that introduced me to you. Uh, Lizzie Pace from Trees for Cities introduced me to you. You subsequently introduced me to uh, Colonel Sally Coltard. Spoke to Sally about nature-based therapy and her defence garden scheme. That introduced me to Dr. Sean Allen, who was a former Royal Marine. And now things are starting to come together in, in this area where we're looking at um, horticultural therapy in a location in Hull and Shipley, as well as engaging veterans on certainly accreditation for tree planting, but on the pathway to employment with the money that's available from the Northern Forest Initiative. So lots of different rabbit holes there if you wanted to go down. Well, let's, re- well, let me, let's start with the let's start with the network aspect of it because I think it's something that um, a lot of people find really difficult and they're scared of. Um, and I think a lot of service people don't realise that they're networking all the time. And I would say that when you go from one posting, one draft to another, um, you usually pick up with someone you knew before and that's just part of your network. Um, it's just not language we use. Um, and 
it's very clear from what you're saying that it's that military network which is beyond people you knew when you were serving but it's just that oh so you were in the navy what ship were you on and then you're away aren't you with a chat about people you know and i've found the same um i've also found that if you find out that someone in an organization has a military background i always ring them first because you just know that they're going to give you the time of day and it it leads to all sorts of things um how do you think we can how do you think we can persuade people that they don't have to hide their military identity. In fact, it's it's an asset. It's a you know bizarrely enough, um, it's a badge of honour that we don't think we appreciate, so we leave. And th that network is invaluable. I, I used to joke um, because I was in a very fortunate position that I travelled extensively across Asia, Middle East, and to America um, for events and to talk, and it was quite frustrating for my ex-wife she said why is it wherever you go you know somebody mm -hmm. I said that's the value of the military network and it what military and rugby in all honesty are more often than not combined and I'll give you an example of um, flying into Dubai an ex-army fullback Stevie M rang him up said Stevie I'm in town next thing you know there's six people there some of them who I knew and I then actually ended up opening an office in Dubai and there was a network for me, ready-made, you know, and if I need, if I had a problem or a question, certainly setting up shop in Dubai is difficult, those guys were on hand. So I would say don't underestimate the value of that military network and don't be afraid to say you, to, to say you are a veteran. I think you, you find that we connect, we will have a laugh and a giggle and pull each other's legs in a military fashion. You know, and we know it's a term of endearment if we're making fun of each other. Mm. But those guys are there for you. And they're, they're there to say, look, don't do this, don't do that, or watch out for this. And, and, it, and it leads to opportunities. Mm. You know, I tend to find that I'm regularly in touch with guys that I've served with, even though I left, wow, 20 years ago. Because, and I had a call this morning with one of the guys in Dubai just talking about him coming back to UK, you know, and it's, I think sometimes people go through life and have those struggles and it's great to just keep that network there because they're invaluable. They, we've all got that same mentality. We have, it. you can't get away from it. Um, I, I'm not sure if I introduced you to Nick Woods, uh, who's doing the resettlement from St. John's University of York. Uh, I've heard of, I've heard of him, yeah. Listen to Nick, and I, and I did when I came back, and he's actually from Hull, another one. He's also Fleet Air Arm, the same as my ex-Fleet Air Arm itself. Yeah. And uh, so we connected very quickly, and I'm in touch with him, and hence he's following what we're doing really closely. Mm. And he starts to understand the difficulties and the struggle, not just for the servicemen, but also for the families when they leave. More so Army than Navy, I think, mm. because of the, the nature of your detachments or deployments and the garrison mentality um it, it, it's fascinating i'm not saying that we have it easier we still transition but to go back to your original question there's no need to be afraid of it and i think actually um with the armed forces the, the veterans badge is i've worn that it's on one of my jackets i've worn it and gone into shops and they've said oh by the way you know you get qualified for 10 percent discount like, oh, great, you know, <laughs> just by wearing a badge, you know, so it's great. And then you can obviously identify other people in a room sometimes. I'm not saying wear it all the time, but yeah. you, tend to do, you tend to gravitate towards each other. Mm. Yeah, no, it's really powerful. So um, so you're now trying to, um, to, to give something back, as it were, and to, um, to, to work with um, people as they resettle and veterans. Um, so um, tell us about your latest um, idea, the Green Task Force. Well, it's come around from the Northern Forest Initiative. We've got a plan to plant, well, not we, the government has a plan to plant 50 million trees over the next 25 years. Now, one of the fundamental issues, fundamental issues with that is we're relying on volunteers to do it. And when volunteers go out and plant trees, they don't always do it in the best possible manner. And we find we have to go behind and replant them, which is a waste of time and effort. Otherwise, the mortality is really high. And I've been 
talking to White Rose Forest, Haywoods, DEFRA, Forestry Commission, Woodland Trust, you name it, and saying, look, we've got to find a mechanism to pay people to plant trees. And then uh, we're heavily involved with Yorkshire Water. They have a project to plant a million trees. And one of their senior managers had said, you know, how do I do that? And I joked and said, just put a team of veterans on it. And I didn't realize how that must have resonated with them because their HR director called me back a week later and said, can we have a serious discussion about this? Because we've just signed up to the Armed Forces Covenant and we don't know how to align with it. And this fits perfectly. So we progressed the idea of then extending the charity to have a commercial angle to undertake um, tree planting and other grounds maintenance work. We've got discussions now on the setup of uh, nature based therapy at Eshel Hall, potentially working with, the Def or working with the Defense Garden Scheme and moving forward on that side with an angle where that's a 220 hectare site that we're pushing now for the veterans that will be going through horticultural therapy at that site to maintain the whole, the whole site. Um, then the signatories that have signed up to the Northern Forest, certainly five of the local authorities have decided that they will plant 250,000 hectares and there are not a lot of delivery partners in the area. The same as in the East Riding, there's only one. So all of a sudden that's starting to resonate and gain traction. So alongside that, we're setting up our own accreditation scheme to qualify people level one, two and three of tree planting so we can be confident that we can engage veterans, send them out under paid contracts to plant trees and then extend that to um, horticulture as well in the summer months. So it's fascinating, a lot going on. Uh, we've just signed an MOU with Hull College where as it stands, we're taking over, or the intention is to take over their redundant horticultural centre and turn it into a forestry nursery and then offer various courses out and then support seedling growth from that nursery for our projects in the East Riding. So fascinating, a lot, a lot happening. That is a lot, that is a lot. Um, so um, what I'm just going to do now, um, it's just to say to everybody, if you've got any questions you want to put to Andy or indeed to me, um, put them in the um, the chat for now and then I'll, I can ask them um, and then uh, uh, there, there'll be an opportunity for a more informal conversation um, when, I, uh, when I turn the recording off. Um, so um, the Green Task Force um, is an extension of, of other projects. Um, uh, what what particular um, opportunities do you think you're going to have coming up in the next coming up few months directly? So we've had a very loose discussion with the Community Forest Trust about taking on two forestry apprentices. Um, that I'm hoping now because the the regulation has changed around that we don't have to take on 16 to 18 year olds. So I'm looking at mature apprentices that have an interest in forestry. Um, I think that's one of the main aspects. We will certainly be looking for people who are available for tree planting under contract in both the Holland Shipley area that will extend throughout Yorkshire. And in both sites, we're going to need to take on supervisors. So we're looking for people that we can bring on board that can take teams out. Uh, we're talking to to Department of Works and Pensions under the new Kickstarter scheme as well, asking them to identify, in fact they have already identified service leavers that are working on universal credit and they will come under our banner as um, full-time paid employees, paid by the government. And um, Our thinking here is that if we've got service leavers and that are coming out that are 18 to 24 and we have supervisors that are ex-military with some form of rank there's a certain element of respect there and we can get these these guys on the path to employment and show them the way and lead into um some form of accredit accreditation and qualification that's one of the discussions we're having with Hull college how we can offer some formal credit um qualifications at the portobello street nursery and in eshol we're talking to the rhs about Set, establishing that as a level two accreditation centre. So a, a lot of different 
moving parts, but it's all coming to fruition. And, and the stepping stone here has been the nature-based therapy and a term that I like to use now, rather than people focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder, but start to focus on post-traumatic growth and put people on the right path. Mm-hmm. As, we, as we all know, you know, when you go out amongst nature, um, you do feel better. And I didn't realize the significance of this until I came back and started to work with veterans who have had issues and realized how beneficial it was for them. So it was merging the two together. It was a no brainer in all honesty. Let's help our veterans that do have issues and also put people who don't have issues, but from a forces background into this sector and doing something that they enjoy and pay them along the way. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's really interesting. The, the other point I observe in this space is that um, there's quite a lot of money, um, charitable money available for people who do have particularly um, mental health concerns. Um, but they are, depending on what figures you quote, three to six percent of the veteran population. And then for everyone else who is merely changing careers, um, there's no specific you know, assistance other than the Career Transition Partnership. And what's um, interesting to me is that there is still a huge challenge there, as you've described and, and everybody knows, in changing your identity. And people have, everybody has, some sort of low level, even if it's a, a type of anxiety. Um, and for some people it becomes more serious most people it doesn't but everybody is what they would call vulnerable at the point of resettlement because they've got so many pressures whether that's they're the prime earner in a in a household that's dependent on them whether it's a loss of identity or whether it's um something that has a diagnosis um and trying to put a commercial package around supporting people is hugely challenging when there's not you know the you know so when you can combine it um, I don't like using charitable money in a way because I don't like the kind of stigma and the label that goes with that. And I don't like the national narrative that says you've been in the forces, therefore something must be wrong with you, um, which, of course, isn't true at all. Um, but it is quite difficult to find a commercial package that works. So I, I really applaud you for, for joining the dots um, to do that. Um, whilst you mull on that, and before you comment on that, in whatever you say next, could you please answer Yvette's very urgent question? I hope she's asking it to you, not me, um, because I don't know. But what is your favourite tree? Mm, I've got a few, actually. I don't think I would single one out. The oak tree, because of what it symbolises in the UK. That's that's front and centre. Is that, is that heart of oak? Is that a naval throwback as well? Um, <laughs> there's a great song behind that. The heart of oak. Um, that's a feel good song as well. So I think, yes, that, there's a link there. Now, I think we've got to oak trees are great because of what's symbolized in the UK, but outside of that, um, I'd say a mango tree because of what it does in certainly in Africa, it's very nutritious and provides a form of income for villagers. And it's you, know, you can see the price of it in the supermarket. So that's if I, if I can have two, if I can be greedy. <laughs> have one for this country and one overseas um when you when you look back um through all this stuff and we can we can talk more about what you're doing now um as, if people um want to um but what do you look back on and say yeah this this worked really well from your personal perspective or or was there anything yeah you know, what's your big piece of advice or thing you wish you'd done differently that you are going to tell these workers in your in your forestry business as it grows up or uh, other you you've got for people here what's the big the regret or the the lesson learned um i think when you come from a military background we're used to a little bit of autonomy and freedom and also being outdoors and when you go into the corporate world which is why i would advocate people come into this sector the land-based sector because when you go into the corporate world you're quite often sat behind a desk or a computer or in a car um and you, you lose that that feel and i didn't realize how passionate i was about the environmental side until literally five or six years after i left the forces and once i did understand it 
I, I, I jumped in wholeheartedly with it. And so my advice is, if, you, if it is a passion and you, you haven't, you get enjoyment out of it, don't go and sit in a box behind the computer, go and find a job that you know you're going to love. And I think most of our forces personnel will enjoy being outside. So that, it's not a regret, Fiona. I think you've got to go where the money is. That's first and foremost, you know, you've got to take a job. But if you can steer it back around to something you enjoy, I, I always use the analogy that Tiger Woods plays golf, not because he loves the money, because he loves the golf and that's his passion. Mm. And, if, and if this, the environment, the outdoors is your passion, then go and find work in that sector. Don't don't put yourself in a, in a, in a biscuit tin. <laughs> don't put yourself in a biscuit tin. <laughs> Excellent. OK, um, well, that's I mean, that is as, as good a place as any um, to end this um, formal part of the meeting on. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to switch this button off. Um, so there we are. We're not recording anymore. And